Hello everyone, in this video we're going to talk about the potassium homeostasis. So we need to understand the basic physiology of the potassium and how is it normally distributed and regulated inside our body and what is the effect of the potassium in the different cells and different areas including the heart muscles and the voluntary muscles and also the nerve uh, um, endings. Also we need to understand um, a few things about hyperkalemia and hypokalemia as well and that will be in the next coming two videos. So first of all, we need to understand the function of the potassium. So potassium is quite important for maintaining a fluid balance, that's one, and also for the nerve impulse and for muscle contraction, including cardiac muscle as well, so smooth and uh, uh, voluntary muscle, contra muscle contraction as well. So it's important for muscles, nerves, and fluids, okay? So the homeostasis of potassium, the normal potassium level is from 3.5 to 5.5, okay? That's one. The potassium, if this is a cell, the potassium is normally present more inside the cell with very few amount outside the cell. That's keeping the cell membrane on a resting polarized state, which we're going to talk about it in a second. Okay, so any change in this balance, if the potassium has started to come outside, the body will start to react immediately. And the way we can regulate our potassium level in our body can happen through some endocrinological production of certain hormones. And these hormones can include insulin, and insulin is technically responsible for. Um, pushing the potassium into the cell. So that's why in case of hyperkalemia, increased potassium level, we usually give insulin to push the potassium inside the cell. And also that's why in case with diabetic ketoacidosis, you give the patient a potassium containing fluid in addition to the insulin, because otherwise the patient can have significant hypokalemia. There is also one more thing. There is an aldosterone production, and this aldosterone is responsible for salt and water retention, which I'm sure we all know this. But in the body, we cannot really replace anything or retain anything without exit change. So for sodium and hydrogen, and sorry, sodium and salt and water retention, in return, we are going to excrete potassium and also hydrogen. That's why the aldosterone can lead to paradoxical aciduria due to increasing the amount of hydrogen in the urine. So this usually works on the distal convoluted tubule and also the collecting duct of the nephron of the kidney. So again, it's also responsible for acid-base balance and the water balance like we explained early. So the acid-base balance, the potassium and the hydrogen are excreted in exchange with salt and water in the distal convoluted tubule. That again will lead to acidosis, can lead to hyperkalemia, and alkalosis can lead to hypokalemia. All right, so very quickly on this diagram. So as you can see here, we have the normal dietary intake of potassium is 100 milliequivalent. And then it comes to the intestine and will be distributed whether it can go into the urine excretion, which is around 90 milliequivalent. That's the main thing. And the urine excretion can happen mainly by aldosterone. Okay. Uh, and the aldosterone, like we said, can lead to exit change of the uh, salt and water by potassium and hydrogen as well. It can also be excreted in the fecal material, and that's 10 milliequivalent and very few amount, around 2% in the, uh, the fluid. Okay. And that's why we mentioned early, it's important to the muscle, for muscle contraction, including the heart muscle and the voluntary muscles as well. We talked about in insulin and beta agonist and also the alkalosis, and these can play a role in uh, 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 moving the potassium inside and outside the cell. So insulin mainly move the potassium inside the cell. Okay, so that's very quickly about the potassium homeostasis. So we explained that the daily intake of potassium is 100 milli equivalent. And usually the potassium gets reabsorbed from the intestine and also uh, uh, can be excreted in the kidneys through the distal convoluted tubule and the collecting duct by the effect of aldosterone. Insulin can push the potassium inside and we know that potassium is normally intracellular. Hyperkalemia is when the potassium shifted from the cell to the outside. We know that the potassium being inside the cell is extremely important to maintain a polarized state on the resting membrane potential and also the potassium efflux or pushing the potassium outside the cell can lead to significant action potential at the beginning and then will end up by flaccid paralysis. And we're coming to this. I will come to this later on, but let's start by the resting membrane potential. If this is the cell membrane, that's the structure of the cell membrane, you have more potassium inside. Look at that. That's lots of potassium inside the cell and very few amount of potassium outside. So the resting membrane potential is usually positive on the outside and negative on the inside. Positive, that's mean we do have more positive uh, electrolytes on the outside, which is mainly by sodium and calcium and less positive ions on the inside, uh, it's mainly formed of potassium. So this is called a state of polarization. So what happens in action potential, 
So when the potassium it starts, it starts to go outside through so the, the voltage gated potassium channels, all right, this will lead to activation of another channel, which is called the sodium and the calcium gated uh, uh, channels. And here, as you can see in this diagram, the sodium has gone outside and the potassium and calcium has gone inside. And this will reverse the rest of membrane potential and will call the action, the action potential to start. Okay, so going back in here, so as you can see here, if we had some more potassium going outside, this will start the action potential. The resting membrane potential is usually sitting at minus 90, and this will be slightly elevated in here. So more potassium in efflux or potassium coming outside the cell, this will lead to the starting of an action potential. But this state will not be maintained for a very long time. After a while, the potassium kept pushing outside. This will lead to imbalance, and the heart muscle will be flaccid and basically paralyzed and can even lead to death, okay? So, the effect of high potassium in cardiac muscle, so initially, it can cause depolarization of the resting membrane potential and can cause bradycardia, okay, bradycardia, and then the heart will be dilated, flaccid, and paralyzed with significant decrease in heart rate. Like we explained, high extracellular potassium depolarizes the resting membrane potential and causing it to be less negative, which will decrease the intensity of the action potential as well. How can we use this in clinical practice? So, since we can make the heart muscle flaccid and, uh, you know, plegic, basically, or paralyzed, so we can use that, uh, uh, we can use some potassium-rich cardioplegic uh, solutions can be used to, uh, uh, you know, um, iatrogenic arrest of the heart, uh, which permit to do some sort of cardiac surgery. So here we're going to move on to talk very briefly about hyperkalemia and hyperkalemia, but I have separate videos for those that will come after this one. So the clinical picture of hyperkalemia, basically the patient can have muscle weakness and cramps, lethargy, and atrial and ventricular arrhythmia, and also paralytic alias as well. So the, so the manifestations of hyperkalemia on the other side, we can get lots of ECG changes. And the way I remember it, so as you can see here, if this is the B, if this is the P, and then you have Q, R, and S. And then the T wave at the end. So what can happen in hyperkalemia, so we're basically getting, you're trying to pull the ends upward and downward. So it's as if you're starting holding the ECG and pulling up and downward. So what will happen is you will have a wide QRS, which is, I'm drawing it already wide, wide QRS, and then you will have a tall and peaked T wave. And also you will have, um, like we explained early, uh, hypertension and even sudden death and arrhythmia as well, in addition to muscle cramps. So as you can see in here, this is a tall peaked wave, which happened in hyperkalemia and also lost, uh, uh, loss of P wave and very wide QRS. So this is basically a, a hyperkalemia result. It can also affect the musculoskeletal system and the GIT. So in the muscles, it can lead to muscle cramps and uh, weakness and even paralysis in the GIT, anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and like we said, hyperactive bowel sounds and abdominal pain. For hyperkalemia urgent treatment, if we did understand the... Uh, the homeostasis of potassium, so we, know, we now know how to push the potassium back inside the cell to get it lower, all right? So the way we can do that, we can, one, give the patient beta agonist, which is able to push the potassium back in the cell, and also insulin as well, in addition to fluid, otherwise the patient might be dehydrated, all right? So we explained this early, so, um, but to go a little bit in more detail, uh, this is a serious condition and can affect the heart and can lead to some ECG changes. So that's why we need to do an A to E approach and under continuous monitoring, and also stop all the potassium containing intravenous fluid, including Hartman's lotion. And if the potassium is higher than 6.5, this is we need to protect the heart first, which is a very crucial uh, uh, piece of information here, is to give the patient something called calcium gluconate, 10 millimeter, milliliter of the 10% calcium gluconate. This needs to be given over 10 minutes, and it should be under cardiac monitoring, and this does not change anything in the potassium level. It mainly just protects the heart from being affected by high potassium. And then after protecting the heart, we need to move on to decreasing the potassium level back to normal. We can do that by starting the patient on fluid and giving insulin and beta agonist. All right. So give the patient 5 to 10 units of insulin, 50 ml, 50% dextrose. Uh, and that's basically the fluid. And also we can give salputamol as well. Hemodialysis might be needed if the potassium is persistently high, and also there is something called calcium rhizonium that can be given as well. But basically, back to the basics, we need to do an A to E approach, protect the heart, and also get the potassium back to normal by giving insulin and also beta agonist and sodium bicarbonate might be given as well. So the next scenario, I'm going to explain hyperkalemia and then 
hyperkalemia after that. So just to summarize what we explained, we talked about the homeostasis of the potassium level, and we understood that the potassium is normally present intracellular more than extracellular, just a very few amount of potassium extracellular. That's important for keeping a polarized state of the cell, which is positive outside and negative inside. All right, and uh, when the potassium is start to be pumped out through potassium uh, voltage gated potassium channels, uh, this will lead to activation of sodium and calcium gated uh, uh, potassium channel. Uh, sorry, uh, sodium and calcium gated channels, and this will lead to influx of sodium and calcium, and it will lead to production of an action potential of the heart. So that happens basically due to efflux of the potassium level at the beginning. It will lead to bradycardia and then will lead to cardioplegic effect. The heart muscle will be flaccid and will get paralyzed. And this happens due to, like we said, the depolarization that happens due to high potassium outside the cell membrane and disturbing the state of, polari of polarization on the cell membrane. We talked about hyperkalemia and also very briefly hyperkalemia and the ECG changes that can happen, the musculoskeletal changes and the GIT changes. So ECG changes is tall and peaked T wave and the bradycardia an absent BP wave, and finally, there is widened the QRS, and again, we said paralyzed uh, you know, uh, heart muscle, and so on. You have musculoskeletal or musculoskeletal complications that will lead to muscle cramps, muscle paralysis, and muscle weakness as well, and the gastrointestinal anorexia, vomiting, and hyperkinetic or diarrhea, diarrhea hyperkinetic or hyperactive bowel sounds, and diarrhea. The urgent treatment of hyperkalemia, the basic understanding is to protect the heart first, and push the potassium back in the cell by giving the patient salbutamol and also the um, insulin in addition to fluids such as dextrose, the 50 ml. All right, so that is the treatment uh, very quickly and very briefly the treatment of hyperkalemia and the homeostasis of potassium.